We are live. Very good evening, everyone. Welcome to iFocus Online, episode 343. Uh, we are on the oculoplasty module number 18. And today is also another masterclass. And uh, it's a pleasure to have Dr. Nitin Dipe from Pune, Skin City Pune, with us today, speaking to us on lasers in periocular aesthetics. So, sir has, uh, is the founder, medical director of Skin City, director of Skin City Postgraduate uh, Institute of Dermatology in Pune. He's uh, been the visiting faculty in LVPI for six years and faculty in Oculoplasty National and APAC meetings. He is the pioneer in institutional practice of cosmetic dermatology and lasers in India. And he, the positions held in the past by him have been a Joint Secretary of Association of Cutaneous Surgeons of India, Executive Committee Member of the Dermatological and uh, Aesthetic Surgery International League, International Travelling Mentor of American Society of Dermatological Surgery. As the forerunner in acquiring the latest technology in this field, he is rightly called as a laser man of India. Advisor to various laser companies for its expertise in uh, designing growth strategies for the Indian market. It's a pleasure to have you, sir, today with us. Uh, a very warm welcome to you and over to you. Thanks, Shepali. Thanks for your kind words. So, am I supposed to start the talk? Yes, sir. Please share your screen and you can actually start the talk. Okay. I welcome you all in this session of the lasers in the Aculoplasty. And uh, I sincerely thank Dr. Santosh Onawar. He has been my mentor, my friend, then there in LV Prasada Institute. And again, while in the Center for Sight also. So today we'll be talking on the lasers in the peri ocular aesthetics. So roughly I will navigate through the, the structure of this talk. I'll be speaking a major chunk of time on the basics of the laser because being in another faculty, understanding the principles of lasers in aesthetic, you need to be very much thorough in the basics of the laser. What is the basics of laser? You need to understand the physics. You have to go dig down till the physics and the quantum physics. But that I will do in a very short <clears throat> and Lucid manner. So, what is laser? So, people call me the laser man not because I was the expert in the laser, but I bought so many gadgets and devices and these toys. I used to say, what is meant by? Laser man, it's the biggest victim of the laser companies. They make me buy the every new technology. And I used to take pride to launch that first time in India. And uh, then I under, then I say, it's a trap or a vicious circle. You keep on buying a new technology. And before you complete the EMI of the banks, again, there is a new technology on the horizon. So there is a no end of new technology coming and launching that. But I take pride that I was the one who launched many technologies first time in India. So I was inspired to learn the physics and the basics of the laser. <clears throat> uh, when I met Rox Anderson, he is the father of the medical lasers. So he is the one who put forth the theory of the selective photothermolysis, which we'll see in detail next uh, <clears throat> and that theory of selective photothermolysis converted the industrial lasers to the medical lasers so he is the father of medical lasers okay now coming to the lasers so what is laser it's acronym of light amplification by stimulated emission of radiation so here you have to understand three concepts the five words. 
so there is a light there is a radiation there are two processes you need to understand one is a light amplification and another is a stimulated emission so what is that we'll see one by one so first layer layman's question whether the lasers can cause cancer so no why because lasers are not ionizing radiations so those are the non ionizing radiations so the ionizing radiations can cause cancer but not the light so laser is basically light the basic component of laser is a light and that is a photon so all the physics is applied is the photon physics or the light physics so though there is a name radiation that radiation comes from actually a description of that energy how the energy travels in our high school physics we have seen the energy travels by conduction convection and radiation so that is a way of transfer so that is how we call light as a radiation and when it is ionizing then only it can cause a cancer but in the common practice <clears throat> we use the ionizing radiation sim simply as a radiation so there is a possibility of confusion so it is a non ionizing radiation once we understand it's a light so laser is a light so if laser is a light then there are lasers which are ultraviolet lasers like you use the excimer laser in the ophthalmology excimer is ultraviolet laser there are visible color laser like the green laser yellow laser red laser and there are some infrared which are the beyond the red so there are various lasers as per the wavelength so the one basic parameter of the laser is wavelength now the <coughs> concept of stimulated emission what is that because laser is generated from certain molecules what are those certain molecules those certain molecules are basically with a excitable atoms or molecules these excitable atoms they get excited by photons we have seen in the nuclear chain reactions there are excitable atoms or molecules which get excited by either electron photon protons neutrons but here these atoms or molecule they get excited by a photon so they absorb one photon of the energy one packet of the energy they become excited the electron goes from the ground orbit to the last peripheral orbit that becomes excited or unstable that throws two photons out and becomes again stable comes to a ground stage so partly excitable molecule absorbs a photon then throws two photons out and then that becomes stable so <clears throat> another thing is here the excitable atom or molecule absorbs one photon of any color any wavelength but it throws out two photons of a same wavelength again we'll rephrase this this excitable atom or laser medium absorbs any packet of energy that may be a photon light of any wavelength any color it can be a packet of energy as a current electricity it can be a packet of energy through radio frequency it can be a packet of energy in a chemical and it throws out two photons of same color means this laser medium can absorb any energy and that converts into double two photons of a single color single wavelength photon so rox anderson says lasers are fancy molecular machines that convert any color of photon or any energy for that say into a same color of two photons so it's a molecular level machinery you give them any light any ordinary flash lamp light and that flash lamp light photons are taken by that laser medium and that throws out two same wavelength photons so this is a very magic machine at a molecular level 
so <clears throat> the next concept is light amplification so what is mean by light amplification is something like the chain reaction in the radioactive substances here we are not talking of radioactive it's a photo excitable atoms we are in a very low energy level the radioactive are very high energy reactions it's like a chain reaction but in a spectrum of photons so how a laser machine is manufactured okay so this is called as a laser tube so what you see a laser machine all other that box what you see is a just a cosmetic that has the electrical the water circulation and the electronics and some switches and the water filtration everything but the laser energy generator is a one box what you are seeing on the screen that box has a laser medium inside so what is that laser medium it can be a co2 it can be a gas like a co2 helium neon it can be a liquid like a dye it can be a solid like rbm crystal so these molecules when there are energy which is pumped from lateral side so this laser tube absorbs this energy and then the atoms here in the laser medium they get excited they start throwing two photons anything which is uh not parallel is absorbed at periphery and you can see there is a one mirror on a front side there is another mirror in the back side so these light photons they reflect on the mirror they come back again they bombard on the another molecule of excitable laser medium again it emits two photons again it goes back it reflect from the mirror again comes in bombards on the another molecule of the laser medium and that's how you get a chain reaction like you get the photons 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 of a same wavelength so here you are pumping the energy by flash lamp an ordinary light goes in the laser medium but a single color single wavelength light comes out so this is called as a stimulated emission and and one fine moment like a click of a camera shutter the shutter opens here and this entire photon they come out and now we guide that photon maybe through optical fiber or maybe articulated arm and that we take to the patient tissue so this is called as a light amplification so this is a very important concept means you are getting two photons of a single wavelength by input of any ordinary light now what is laser there are three cardinal features of lasers why laser is more special than the ordinary light okay so laser is a monochromatic collimated and coherent what's that let's see what is this it's a prism the ordinary light falls on a prism and it is split into that with gear so all that each different color or wavelength is separated so this is ordinary light is all the components of the light there what is this this is long pulse ndag laser 1064 nanometer there's a red there's a <clears throat> red or infrared spectrum so this red light there is only single wavelength so there is a no split of this light so this is a monochromatic single color single color means single wavelength so lasers are monochromatic so there is no mixture of light but it's a single color what is mean by collimated have you seen a laser show you can see this laser beam so this other light though so strong light but their intensity doesn't go beyond certain meters but this laser beam which is again parallel and same intensity almost for kilometers so this is called as collimated means parallel so this ordinary light here is not parallel but this laser light is parallel so it is monochromatic and collimated means parallel now the third property is coherence what is coherence not only at the macro level or visible level but even at a molecular level at photon level when the photons vibrate up and down up and down they vibrate 
in the same phase all up all down all up all down and you see there are millions and billions of these photons when they vibrate in the same phase same up same down then it has a huge energy why the lasers are so powerful because all the photons vibrate oscillate in the same phase so that is why the laser is monochromatic coherent and it becomes intense ordinary light it diverges of different wavelengths so it is not intense not powerful so now we understand the laser physics laser physics laser is basically a photon or a light and light has two different characters a light we follows the rules of quantum physics also because light is a particle and light is a energy also it's a wave so light follows the principles of quantum physics and the light physics both so in the quantum physics it's a photon it's a particle it has a wavelength it is a frequency and the longer is the frequency the short is the wavelength and vice versa so the short wavelength lasers like the excimer laser are very high energy photons because they have high frequency the frequency is equal to the energy and a very long wavelength like ndr they have low energy photons so anything which is a very short wavelength that is high frequency and there is high energy photons so anything in 300 400 500 600 nanometers is a very powerful and now <clears throat> this energy and power concept whenever you have the energy energy per unit per centimeter square that is the fluence what we call in the laser and power is the the energy joule per cent per time per second and the power density is a the joule per centimeter square per second so all these matters how fast you are giving the energy how concentrated in a short short narrowest part of the tissue you are giving the energy that determines the energy and the power of the laser and that changes the laser tissue interaction when laser falls on a tissue what happens we need to understand first understand the tissue skin skin has the layers like epidermis dermis and subcutaneous the hypodermis see the thickness epidermis is hardly 100 microns dermis is 1 to 4 mm thick it is vascularized epidermis is blood free there is no no vessels and subcutaneous fat that is a fat and the collagen and septa everything focus on this slide so here you can see the skin has the thin colored epidermis almost little bit less colored dermis and again less colored non colored hypodermis with vascularity see the thickness of the epidermis only that 100 micron 0.1 mm of the epidermis which has melanocytes and that is why we need to protect that because melanocytes are the neurocast origin once you damage the uh, <coughs> melanocytes you can't have new melanocytes so you get the white spots there so you need to protect this upper 100 micron and that is the real skill you want to go 1 mm below you want to go 2 mm below but you want to touch you own touch the epidermis so this is epidermis it has a stratum corneum non living and a living basal cells in dermis your collagen and vascularity in subcutaneous it's a fat and vascularity so what happens when you fire a light on a tissue on a skin 7% of that light any light which falls on our skin will reflect and 93 95% will enter the skin so what if the light enters the skin what happens that's called as a photobiology of skin something is transmitted through and through if you take a laser pointer you fire on your finger you can see the red light coming out of the nail means some photons they fire go through your skin dermis bone cartilage and nail and they come out that is why you can see the red light on the other part of the nail so anything which 
transmits through and through the tissue. Some part gets reflected, some part gets scattered, and some part gets absorbed. Only absorbed light will have the tissue effect and not the total energy. So how many joules you give, that's useless. Anything which is absorbed in the target molecule has a clinical effect. This is called as Grothus Trepper law. So why lasers are so unique? Because of a because all the old lasers were like industrial laser. The laser were used to cut the diamond. One of the first lasers imported in India were in the Surat and the Gujarat in diamond industry to cut the diamonds. So laser was so powerful, it used to cut the diamonds and diamonds are known to be the toughest substance in the world. But the same lasers now we use on a tissue, we use on the nose, you use on the lips, you use on the cheek and you use in the eyes. The most delicate part of the body is the eyes and you use the laser there. So how it become a very tough, wild industrial laser is converted into a very specific, very soft, a protective medical laser. And that's because of this theory of selective photothermolysis. Rox Anderson put for this theory. That is how he is a father of a medical laser. So selective photothermolysis means only target absorbs a selective color of light. That light is converted to heat. And that heat will destroy the target. Target absorbs the photon. It hits itself. It destroys itself. So it's a molecular targeting. So selectivity is the key. So Rox Anderson is the father of medical lasers. And it is not the magic that industrial laser has become a very specific and safe laser, but it's the theory of selective photothermolysis. And how it works? By adjusting the parameters of that laser light. Which parameters? Like wavelength, exposure duration, fluence, and spot size. If you adjust this parameter, then laser become very selective. Out of the all heterogeneous molecules in your skin or any tissue, it can target only one molecule. And that selectivity is the magic of the laser. Now this is the absorption spectrum of the various molecules. <laughs> it is a lab finding. So there's no reason why this is, but this is a laboratory observation that various molecules So these various molecules, if we fire various wavelengths, then each molecule will absorb some wavelength more, some wavelength less. So this is the chart. So you can see that most of the molecules, the color molecule will absorb the wavelength of say 400, 500, 600. Water will absorb maybe around 800, 1000, 3000. So each target molecule absorbs a certain wavelength at peak. Second principle is the exposure duration, means how long you are giving that energy. And the very important principle of this selective photothermolysis is instead of giving the energy in a continuous way, if you give the energy in a discontinuous way in a pulse, like instead of hitting that target for seconds, milliseconds, if you heat that in a microsecond, milliseconds, then there is a magic. What is that magic? A continuous light will cause a transmission of heat in a surrounding area. The transmission of heat in the surrounding area is a side effect. If you give the light in a pulsed way, means only for few milliseconds, few microseconds, then there is no time for the target molecule to transmit the heat in the surrounding area. So there is a concept of thermal relaxation time. The time required by the target molecule to absorb the enough energy before it passes to the surrounding tissue. And the wider is the thicker is the target, the longer it takes to heat. Because the 
hitting time of the target is depends upon the volume of the uh, that molecule volume of that tissue target molecule so it changes with the square of square of the diameter of that target so the thicker is the target the longer you need to hit to destroy that target so you can see the tattoo particle will require the nanoseconds wavelength while the epidermis will require the microseconds rbc will require microseconds and the hair follicle will require the milliseconds the fluence energy delivered per unit area highest tolerable fluence generate the best response risk of side effects also increase with the increased fluence skin type is used to select the fluence exposure duration the lasers <clears throat> so there can be the millisecond lasers to the nanosecond lasers so pulse there are long pulse lasers short pulse lasers and ultra short pulse lasers there are millisecond lasers there are microsecond lasers there are nanosecond lasers and in ophthalmology you have the pico and the uh, and the femtosecond lasers so the the short is the energy pulse the limited is the damage area so if you want to be very precisely ablative it has to be millisecond nanosecond or picoseconds so <clears throat> and next is spot size for given fluence larger spot size yield deeper tissue effect means if you want to have your, your target is deeper you need to have a larger spot size so if you want to just have a very shallow ablation you will have a very narrow spot size but for a laser hair removal where the depth of the hair follicle is 3 to 4 mm you need to have a larger spot size so each way now how to design a laser i want to design a laser machine okay i need to choose the target first i want to kill hair follicle i want to kill the tattoo i want to kill the blood vessels then i choose a wavelength which goes the enough depth reaching my target then the cooling will protect the upper epidermis so the lasers can be classified with wavelength like red lasers green lasers ultraviolet and infrared lasers according to the exposure durations there are millisecond microsecond nano and picosecond <coughs> lasers according to the laser sources solid like yeah crystals liquid like the dye lasers the laser source is a gas like a helium laser and there can can be diode electronic source like a diode so lasers can be classified in different ways so this laser when falls on a tissue what happens either this laser energy is converted to heat that is called as a photothermal effect means light is converted to heat so there is a coagulation there is a vaporization and there is selective photothermolysis <laughs> so this diagram shows how the tissue will react to a photothermolysis means the laser falls here in the center so in the nearest area there is a more than 100 degrees celsius if it is a water containing tissue star important if it is water containing tissue it is more than 100 the water evaporates and in that vapor the entire tissue get evaporated we call that as a plume of a tissue so anything which is more than 100 degrees celsius is a vaporization of tissue anything less than 100 will call will cause a thermal damage there is a coagulation or charring anything less than 50 degree will cause a reversible thermal damage and beyond that will be just thermal diffusion uh, mild heating with no no clinical effects so <clears throat> a co2 laser will have more of a thermal effect coagulation charring and other side effects rbm ag laser it has absorption more in the water so it has a more chances of vaporization and less chances to transmit the heat so there is a less coagulation less charring so rbm is a less thermal laser co2 is a more thermal laser now we have the ultraviolet lasers 
200 to 400 that works on a chemical bonds in the molecules they don't generate the heat but they changes the chemical reaction so that works on the dna and the rna and the protein denaturalization so most of the ultraviolet lasers they just changes the bond in the tertiary quaternary structure of the proteins what is this is it familiar so this is excimer laser used for keratoplasty very good how it works uh excitation it's basically an excitation dimer how you how you operate with this so you cut the cornea you puncture okay. the cornea how it works how you do the keratoplasty you cut and stitch it no yeah. We put it refine and usually we put it refine and then we suture the uh, graft to the uh, the graft to the residual cornea. Okay, so basically this is used to slice the cornea. That is horizontally. You are not puncturing the cornea, but you want to take a slice of a cornea, maybe ten microns, twenty microns, or maybe fifty microns. Thickness, flap. You, you take the flap of the cornea, maybe 10, 20, or the 50 microns. So, is cornea opaque? No, it's a transparent structure. So, what is the examer laser? It's a light or current or energy or um, sound or what is that? It's a light based uh... light. So, examer is a light. Yes. So, a light. When you fire on a transparent tissue like cornea, what do you expect to happen? If a light falls on cornea, what is the normal expectation? What the light should, how the light should behave? A part of it will get reflected, a part of it will pass through, and part of it gets absorbed. Okay. So, <clears throat> if it is a transparent tissue, so most of the light should Pass, pass through. Yes. So we expect that laser or light to pass through the cornea, but here, a examer laser, that photon, that light is sitting on a cornea and making a slice, not going inside. What is this? What is this? This is another laser, argon laser. Which is again a light, it has a photons, which passes through the cornea, through the aqueous, the vitreous, the lens, and goes to the retina. retina. So the light is expected to go from the cornea till the retina. But here it is not going in, sitting on the top of a transparent tissue, and here it is going through all the tissues and reaching the retina. So you ophthalmologist may not appreciate it, but for a layman, it's not nothing less than a magic. A light, which has no intelligence, it has no brain, just a photon. So some photon, they sit on the cornea and they go laterally rather than going straight. They go laterally and make a slice. And some photons go through and through and make a blast there and coagulate the vessel. So for a layman, it is nothing, nothing less than a magic. So how a light can stop and sit on top of the transparent subject and how a light, same light with a different wavelength goes inside through and through and make a heat and coagulation and burning there. So this is nothing less than magic. So that is why the medical lasers are so special. And this Specialty of the laser comes from the selectivity. So here they are selectively targeting the corneal tissue and slice them, and it selectively target the vessels over here. And this selectivity comes through the selective photothermolysis by adjusting the wavelength, by adjusting the exposure duration, adjusting the spot size, and adjusting the other parameters. <clears throat> so this is the magic of selectivity.
so with this the basics of the lasers physics we go to the clinical application of the lasers around eyes okay there are hair reduction lasers pigment lasers vascular lasers resurfacing lasers and surgical lasers so you can classify the laser as per their use or as the clinical indications or their mechanisms so <clears throat> in laser basically the lasers mm, their mechanism what the target because lasers are selective the target a very specific target so there you have to choose a target and then design a laser i want to kill a hair follicle i will have a hair reduction laser i want to kill a pigment re remove the pigment i have a pigment laser i want to block a capillary that's a vascular laser i want to remove one layer of skin like you do the slicing of cornea and eczema that's a resurfacing laser and surgical laser we want to cut it or coagulate it which is surgical laser and apart from this, the other energy based devices are uh, we use around eyes are electrocautery this age old radio frequency cautery that is ablative what you use but there are non ablative rf also and there is sublative rf also i am not covering this today because it will be too much for one talk and there is a high fo high intensity focus ultrasound you might have heard that in urology and other things but there is a more surgical a non ablative high intensity focus ultrasound just targeting the collagen hitting the collagen and tightening of the skin as used on the face on the eyelids that is a high fo okay now we'll start with the hair reduction lasers hair is a crown of woman's beauty but what if those hair grow at a wrong place so we want the hair in the right place and we want to remove the hair from the wrong place the target is the melanin in the shaft of the hair biological target is a hair follicle the entire hair follicle <clears throat> so you just don't want to kill the hair shaft because there's a dead part hair shaft is a dead part what is alive is a hair follicle surrounding that hair shaft <laughs> hair follicle the depth is 3 to 4 mm and on the face we use entire face the full body hair removal but around eyes we use for the eyebrow shaping the parameters wavelength any wavelength more than 600 is used for the Remember, in the past they used IPL, intense pulse light, which is not laser but intense light, six fifty or seven hundred nanometers. Eight hundred ten diode laser is a very typical, a very specific and the good laser for the laser hair reductions. Alexander seven five five, India ten sixty four nanometers or a combination. We have triple wavelength. We have. <coughs> Here the pulse width used is a 30 millisecond to 150 millisecond, so it's a millisecond lasers. Your examiner is a picosecond lasers, so it, this is a millisecond lasers. Spot size here is a 6 mm and wider. Cooling of skin is required because we want to burn the melanin in the hair, but we don't want to burn the melanin in the skin. Sessions 8 to 15, interval 2 to 4 months. Okay. how exactly we kill this hair so initially we wanted to target the only shaft but then we realize there is a bulge and there is a bulb so this bulge also has some stem cells this bulb also has a stem cells so we need to go deep enough we need to go peripheral enough around the hair follicle so now the newer concept is each wavelength will have a different penetration so we want to have a blend of different wavelengths in a same machine same machine firing three different wavelengths when you fire that laser light it is a mixture of three different wavelengths so it's a 755 which is alexandrite 810 which is diode 1064 which is india all these three wavelengths they can be generated and fired together that's called as a cocktail wavelength or a triple wavelength diode lasers <clears throat> initially we saw there was a laser medium that laser medium get excited and that emits the photons but nowadays you don't need a laser medium 
the research in the diode has made a very high quality diodes now any diode the diodes of the today can generate any wavelength so diode is basically electronic circuit and that can generate convert that light into another light that's photon it can convert a electricity into another photon so the diodes of today can generate 800 810 820 860 900 1064 any color can be produced from a diode so what we traditionally understood, the lasers have a laser medium that Yag crystal, then we have the helium gas, we have the CO2 gas and something all. Now, only diode with a change in the circuit, we can have a different colors of the lasers. So this is a new thing which will confuse your laser physics. So there is a combination of the lasers. <clears throat> so which combination? One third, one third, one third, or maybe the 50, 25, 25, the three different wavelength, three different photons mixed together and fire on the laser follicle, hair follicle that can kill the hair follicle. So there are different ways how you use that, that will come when you want to learn in detail about the laser hair removal. Either you have to stamp one by one shots or it can use like a paintbrush you keep on firing and bulk hit that entire area that's another new way of doing laser hair reduction how many sessions initially they said three then they said five now we say 10 to 15 sessions or two to three years that is a typical protocol of the laser hair reduction why so many sessions because not all the hair follicles are in growing phase not all the hair follicles are of the same width not all the hair follicles will have the same color content concentration and that changes a different set of the hair follicle will be susceptible at a specific combination of parameters so we need have need to have very different parameters every time so my mantra to get a good result in the lhr is multiple wavelengths multiple pulse widths multiple passes and do for multiple times so that gives that targets different sets of the hair follicles with different parameters, thickness, weight, color concentration, they get targeted at different times. This is pseudo follicular is bar B in the male, we, or we can have this beard lining. We can have this uh, hair removal in the Baker's nevus. Here, you're not targeting the skin, but we are killing the hair. So this is, again, a selectivity. I can protect the skin by cooling and penetrate the laser deep enough to target the hair follicle. This is found tail, spina bifida. This is found tail, a case of spina bifida. This is normal hormonal imbalance, polycystic or end disease. Here we <coughs> so the next type of the laser which we need very commonly on the face around eyes is a vascular laser. So what is vascular laser? Which targets a vessel. So a typical vascular laser will require pulse width less than the thermal relaxation time of the vessel. Initially PDL, pulse dye lasers were the best vascular lasers. They used to have a 0 0.5 millisecond, 450 microseconds but that used to have a lot of purpura. Then they shifted that pulse width to the 1.5 milliseconds. It is a 1500 microseconds. It can be <clears throat> little wider also. One, two, four milliseconds also can be used. And So, <clears throat> the wavelength, okay, in the absorption spectrum, hemoglobin absorbs peak at 577. Then the company changed the laser machine wavelength to 585 because to avoid the purpura. Now they use 595. So, the pulse dye is described to be the gold standard. The PDL multiplex is a platinum standard. It's a combination of the pulse dye and the NDI laser in the same beam. So low dose NDI laser will convert 
the hemoglobin to cyanomyth hemoglobin and that will have a more absorption of the pulse dye laser. So one laser will convert the hemoglobin to the mm, myth, <coughs> myth hemoglobin and that will have more absorption of the next wavelength. So dose required of each wavelength is low and less side effects. So see this electron microscope of a capillary. RBC are colored, but the capillary cell wall is a colorless and laser will not target the capillary wall. So what do you want to kill? What do you want to coagulate? What do you want to destroy? Is the RBC only? No. We want to use the RBC as a vehicle. I want to heat the RBCs, coagulate and little bit spread of the heat around these RBCs till the capillary wall. So here you want little bit non-selectivity. If we have a laser which will target only RBCs and not targeting the capillary wall. So that's a very specific laser but not useful. I don't want to kill RBCs. I want to kill the capillary wall. So we need little bit longer wavelength not 585, 575, we need 600 or plus and we want to hit for a longer time. So here we give some relaxation in the selectivity because we want to be non-selective, not restrict your damage only to the RBCs, but go beyond RBCs and have the capillary wall. There are two competitors of the pulse dye laser. Pulse dye laser used to cost maybe the millions and millions, maybe around more than a crore what it, it cost. But now there are some other machines which give equally good results in the vascular. The one is NDAG laser. The NDAG laser used for hair removal. But if you have the pulse width of 5-6 milliseconds, then it can be used as a vascular laser in hemangioma. And there's another laser, which is IPL. It's not a laser, but light. And if you have a, we'll see how it, the dye wheel is IPL laser on a harmony machine, it is a double filter. Double filter means it will have one glass filter which will filter anything less than 500 nanometers. There's another filter which will filter more than 600 nanometers means it will have a narrow band of the light. It will have a wavelengths 500, 510, 520, 560, 590. All these wavelengths are available but nothing less than 500, nothing more than 600. And in this 500, 600, you have the most absorption in the hemoglobin. Another is a 550 to 600. It's still ideal because 532 is absorbed in the melanin. 580 is absorbed based in the hemoglobin. So if you have something to filter out less than 550 and if you have something to filter out more than 600. So this type of IPL is best to target the vascular lesions. We'll see how they are used here. So, see the melanin absorption and hemoglobin absorption. So, this hemoglobin absorption, you see it as a 5, 545, 585, 590. So, if you cover this, you are covering the absorption of the hemoglobin. So, this light is mainly absorbed in hemoglobin. And so, you can use that in very low dose. So, which wavelength is vascular? I always ask the my students and the residents. We traditionally, if you see in the MCQ, what is the vascular wavelength? It's a 585, 595, because that's the typical wavelength of a pulse dye laser. But if you have any other machine like IPL and other machines, a 1064 nanometer is vascular in a hemangioma. A 575 Alexandrite is vascular for telling the ectasia. 650, 570 is vascular for port wine stains. 544 is vascular for port wine stains, 590 in port wine stain and hemangioma both. So all these wavelengths can be used as a vascular. How? We'll see in various vascular lesions how we, first is port wine stain. Blanchability will determine the outcome. Early lesions respond best. Indian skin require more than 10 sittings. It is a childhood type of port wine stain and the adult type with higher hypertrophy. You start early, as early as one month of the age. So you can have a very good clearance like this. 
the adult type when you cross more than 3 or 5 years the results are much less so it works early age only telangiectasia again telangiectasia they use the pulse dye and the india laser in the western countries but here we use the ipl a vascular ipl with double filter 500 to 600 nanometer 550 to 600 nanometer ipl is useful in the telangiectasia it just blocks the capillaries not affecting the skin not burning the skin it is just blocking the capillaries without burning the skin so vascular laser <coughs> for the scars the red scars the young early scar a vascular specific ipl can be used in the to prevent the erythema in the young scars okay baker's nevus is a black birthmark ideally should require a pigmentary laser but i had a series of cases where i use a vascular laser to treat the pigmentary so this is a pigmented birthmark baker's nevus and i use 570 nanometer which is a vascular ipl and this worked in a pigment so half side treated with the q switch which is a pigmentary laser and half treated with the dye wear which is a vascular laser and to our surprise the side treated with this vascular has no scars and good clearance of pigment than treated with the q switch india laser so this vascular laser is a better pigmentary laser in the black birthmarks or the black spots so that was a very different findings than what other people used to believe so this is an innovative use of the lasers and this can you can use this only when you master the physics so because i know here what works best so again here the pigment people use a pigmentary laser and in indian skin you treat this with a pigmentary laser you get a white spots you get a depigmentation you damage the melanocytes without damaging the melanocytes i use the dye vl or the vascular ipl here and that has a nice clearance here so this 540 570 wavelength is a pigmentary or vascular it's a both it's a relative density of target if i fire the same on a hemangioma it will be absorbed in a hemoglobin if i fire this on a cafe ole macule it will be absorbed in a melanin so it depends upon where you are firing which target is available in front that will absorb that light so the same laser if i fire on the pigment it will target the pigment if i fire on the capillaries it will target the hemoglobin Trobery hemangioma early branchable and slow filling lesions they work well Pulse dye laser was supposed to be the best, but we use the India lasers. Little bit scarring, but the results are great. So this early treatment of the hemangioma that gives a very nice clearing. Once it become thick, then it can leave a residual fibrosis. In early stage, in one treatment, you can see it is clear. So, indication for early interventions are periorificial, like periorbital, perinasal, periocular, peri. <clears throat> so, all this periorificial, we need to be very aggressive in treating, likely to compress a vital structure or ulcerated. Upper idea hemangioma was the thing which I picked up very early because I my association with the oculoplasty in the LVPI that made me very confident to treat around eyes. We need to treat the upper eyelid hemangioma very fast because it has a risk of developing amblyopia. So India lasers, internal eye shield is necessary, higher tangentially not directly focusing on the eyeball like this so once is this the child has a risk of developing an amblyopia now the only laser is not enough here we 
first shrunk this with the laser and then my friend Milind Naik operated this to have a reshaping of the eyelid. But if we start hitting early, here no surgery, only laser can control the growth here. You can see very nicely controlling the growth without scarring, without deformity, no need of surgery here if you start early. This is a heavy malformation, again operated in the liprasal. So no laser will work here because it is very deep and very thick. Laser will not penetrate here. Treat early, okay, you can arrest the growth. Treat early, arrest the growth. Periorificial again, treat early. Without any deformity, without any scarring, you can control the lesion. Next indication is a ulcerated hemangioma. A ulcerated hemangioma will cause bleeding and laser itself is a hemostasis. So hemostatic treatment is a laser only because you block the capillaries below. So just give antibiotic, control the infection and fire to block the capillaries and the blood supply below. So this is the... In one treatment, it stops the bleeding. It dries out. So, ulcerative hemangioma, the, the treatment is the now the hemangioma tip of nose. Again, if you don't treat, it will have a deformity of the nose because if you don't treat, you will have ulceration, scarring, and that will leave the scars here. If you treat early, there are no scars. If you don't treat, you have a scar. So there is a need to treat early if it is a periorificial. This AVM on the tongue, a single treatment is gone. This is angiokeratoma treated with the intralegional kinocord at the place to prevent the recurrence. Again, angiokeratoma. Angiokeratoma fordyce. This is hemolympangioma again with a long plus india laser. Combinations. You can use a, a very deep penetrating long plus india with a superficial vascular lesion together. You can have this vascular laser with kinocot, intraregional steroid. You can have the laser with the topical timolol and with the oral coprenolol or you can combine the laser with the oral steroids. So there are various combinations. So this is a ulcerated hemangioma. It was affecting the <coughs> uh, joint there, the mobility. So here treated with the laser and the steroid. So here you see one part is treated with the intralegional steroid and other part with the lasers. So the when seeing this result, Milind Naik challenged me that our steroid works wonder than your lasers. Then we decided to make a split study. So the hemangioma lesion, a nodular hemangioma, half part treated with the intralegional steroid and half part with the long pulse NDI laser. And we treated again and again and again. And finally, the result was the side treated with the long pulse india laser has a scarring. The side treated with the steroid has no scarring, but there is no complete resolution of the lesion. In fact, there has been the varicosities and the vascular changes surrounding. So, this is the side effect of steroids, the intralegional injection of kinocord that caused these varicosities of this vessel around and uh, India causes scarring. So we concluded it is not the only steroid or only lasers. We combine this the steroid injections and laser together and then we made a protocol to have the intralegional steroids and the long pulse India laser together that works faster. This was trial inspired 
while I was there in the early process. So the steroid will have its own side effect and the laser will have its own side effect. We, we combine, you can avoid a side effect on the both. Okay, the next, the dilemma is to laser or not to laser if it is a peri or vital or peri nasal. This was a case 30 years ago, a best plastic surgeon treated the nasal tip hemangioma with excision. Now this patient came after 30 years. So that time the best plastic in the town because no laser was available 30 years ago. So this was outcome with the best possible plastic surgery. Now similar case what we had, we treated with the long pass India laser. One treatment. Healed second treatment. Healed well. Third treatment. And now. So preserving the shape of the nose, no deformity, no scarring or very minimal scarring. So this can be output outcome with the lasers and this is outcome with the surgery. So no wonder the laser has been a magic when you treat the hemangiomas, which was otherwise a very uh, threatening condition with a lot of the ulcerations and the bleeding and other thing and with the surgery with having a very, because the limited outcome with the excision surgery is here, the laser is a magic. Again, another case, <clears throat> the nose, the menjuma treated with a limited dose of long pulse index laser, heals, This is the outcome with the laser, no deformity, no scar, nothing compared with this when there was no vascular laser available. So laser is nothing than a magic when it comes to the peri or official birthmarks. So here this hemangioma, nodular hemangioma, before it grew, we could control with the lasers. Okay, now the debate of the lasers versus propranolol. Now, initially, it was very much exciting to have propranolol on. Everybody start using propranolol. And now, I think you guys are better to share what is the review of literature now with the propranolol. So, there has been a long term and the permanent <clears throat> defect in the cognitive function and the learning disabilities in the kids who receive the propranolol. The propranolol basically which uh, masks the signs of the hypoxia and the hypoglycemia and there is a unnoticed damage to the brain at that age and that reflects later in the life with the learning disability. So uh, you guys will be in a better position to share what is the status of propranolol. Again, the debate is not lasers or propranolol. I believe it has to be in combination. A steroid with lasers, propranolol with lasers because not a single treatment will yield the best result. A combination, a perfect combination of all these, the steroids, propranolol and lasers, either intralesional or systemic, that gives a better and a safer outcome. Now the last one is the pigmentary lasers. Now again, IPL 540, IPL 570, Q switch in DIA 64 or 532, all these can be used as pigmentary lasers. So <clears throat> for superficial pigment, you can use IPL or 5, see, 500, 570, 532, 560, 5 to 600. Short wavelength used for superficial pigment. A pigment deep enough, we require 1064. So cafe ole macules, here I use not a pigmentary laser, but I use a resurfacing laser. Here again, I use a resurfacing laser. Here I use a Q switch NDI laser 1064 for new water. Now the new water. 
just see the the part which is not treated or less treated the periorbital part with the surrounding so usually we treat less on the eyelids for two reasons one for safety reason but there's not really a real thing i usually keep the eyelids behind because this will appreciate the patient how the good clearance they got on the face then in the second phase again i treat for couple of more sessions on the eyelids so the eyelid act as a control to appreciate the results this is new supporter with q switch india laser 1064 nanometer spot size 4 maybe the fluence around 6 to 10 joule per centimeter square lastly resurfacing lasers so this is a giant hairy melanocytic nevus around eyes no surgery would have given a scarless result and so this is resurfacing debulking of the nevoid cells debulking and you can say this is a nice bleaching or debulking resurfacing without scarring at all so here no surgery would have given such a great result this is i call a horizontal debulking in nevus we believe that there should be excision excision is a vertical debulking here i believe in a horizontal or layer wise debulking so this is the treatment with the ultra pulse co2 laser which is active fx less thermal laser without scarring just resurface it so this resurfacing is a better option than using a pigmentary laser here again this is resurfacing around eyes also and it fills well with a dilution of pigment otherwise nothing else works in a capillary macules so this is a resurfacing laser this is my new technique which uh, <clears throat> i presented in an under publication now lastly last few slides on the eye protection during the lasers so we have pigment targeting lasers we have infrared lasers we have ultraviolet lasers resurfacing the lasers so we use normally external eye shields that's enough for most of the lasers when you directly treating on the eyelids you require internal eye shields they are metallic they are plastic if you are using anything like radio frequency electrocautery around your eyes or on eyelids use a plastic eye shield why because electrocautery radio frequency are electric currents so you don't want a metal around but whenever you are using long pulse india glazers or any pigmentary laser use a metallic why because those are photons or not electric currents so in all the thermal lasers you use metallic in in all the electric currents and the radio frequency you use a plastic so i'll share my article there is a minimum standard guidelines of care for requirements of a setting up a laser room so how to set up a laser room in that the last i have mention about the laser eye protection and how to use eye shield what are their uh the power of that <coughs> eye shield how the goggles should be used how the goggles should be maintained and in case of the accident how what should be sop if you get accidental fire around eyes or in the eyes so there are so thank you very much uh, i'm done with the topic here with the lasers around the eyes it's a, the peri ocular lasers in the oculoplasty i have not covered the resurfacing laser i have not covered the skin tightening lasers and i have not covered the other energies like the hifu and the radio frequency and there are so many other new technologies that's a matter of another talk in the future so basically i i i insisted to focus more on the laser physics and laser basics because i believe there are many fellows are attending this and they will be referring to so refer again and again because unless you understand the physics you won't master the lasers so you need you, you need, need to master the physics once you understand physics you can safely use the lasers in any indication in any area thank you very much
thank you so much sir so, for such an elaborate lecture uh, i hope and all the postgraduate students viewed uh, they will have a ready made presentation for their examinations as well uh, we have a few questions from the social media portal sir with your kind permission can we proceed to the question yeah yeah we can we can yes so the first question is what is the post procedure care after using lasers in the periocular region okay again to be specific if you are using a hair removal laser ablative and non ablative lasers a non ablative means if you are using the hair removal laser laser hair reduction maybe icing the cool the area with ice because protecting the melanocyte is important so in any laser treatment icing or cooling of the a cool air or icing take the ice in a g pouch in a plastic pouch and start using or you can have that ice packs in the fridge and cool that area for next couple of minutes 5 10 minutes then use a topical moisturizing cream and then ask the patient to avoid the sun exposure on that area because that area is uh, inflame um solen and the ultraviolet light on that area or a sunlight on that area for the tanning so cooling moisturization and some protection these are the three in a non ablative if it is ablative the standard wound care usually we uh <clears throat> a topical ointment aqua for very rarely we recommend antibiotic cream and then oral anti inflammatory and the antibiotics if it is a ablative laser if you remove a mole if you remove the freckles if you use to remove one layer of skin there we prefer the oral antibiotic not the antibiotic creams because on any wounded area if you use an antibiotic cream you have chances of sensitization so not much antibiotic cream oral antibiotic with very bland moisturizing cream in a ablative treatments yes so the next question is what is the risk of laser induced cataract changes or retinal changes due to multiple periocular laser treatments okay so if you use the laser like the examer laser what you use is uh, that's in milliseconds what you guys use is the uh, picosecond what the ultraviolet laser or ultraviolet light what you use in a vitiligo treatment or psoriasis treatment where we take that light on the body those patients are required to take the treatment for 10 minute 20 minute every time and maybe 50 100 times that time uh, eye protection uv eye gear is required otherwise you have chances of the um, posterior capsular opacities are, are common with that but with a prolonged exposure but a very short exposure has not evaluated but less chances if you use eye shield less chances retinal damage yes if you fire directly in the eyes then you have chances of because retina has a very sensitive uh, cells which absorbs almost all the lights and anything in 500 530 540 590 600 nanometer which is a very much absorbed almost all absorbed in that um, retinal cells so so there the, the chances of eye damage are much more anything which is a short width short pulse width like the q switch india laser which is damaging to the eyes anything which is a longer a hair removal laser which is in milliseconds so the same jules if you fire in nanosecond in picosecond or millisecond that determines the damage anything which microsecond millisecond is a more damaging anything in milliseconds and seconds is a less damaging so hair removal laser will have less damage but q switch india laser Uh, a pigmentary laser which is a nanosecond laser is more damaging so but if you is so sorry so please please continue sir no next question <clears throat> so could you please elaborate on the concept of q switching in india laser okay q switching theoretically means it's a quality switching means What is quality of laser? Uh, 
कोहरेंस कॉलिमेशन क्वालिटी ऑफ लेजर मीन्स वेन द क्वालिटी चेंजेस मीन्स लेजर ऑल टूगेदर चेंजेस इज अ वेवलेंथ ओके so basic quality of laser is our any light is a wavelength a red light and blue light has a different effects so a 1064 is a red light and divided by 2 532 is a green light so red becomes green when it is a 1064 is converted to 532 so there are some crystals there are some glass crystals specific crystals when the light passes through that That ten sixty four is converted to five thirty two. That was magic that time. So you, your laser is producing your laser is producing ten sixty four, and that passes through a glass crystal, and that becomes five thirty two nanometer. Means a red light becomes green light. That's actually a quality switching. in the same laser same machine in the handpiece only just you have to pass one filter one glass filter and that quality changes so that is actual the quality switching but many people they confuse that with the changes in the pulse width they say that it is if it if it is nanosecond laser it's a q switch but that's a different parameter quality switching is a switching of a wavelength From 1064 to 532. Now you have a, a different generator for 532. You have different generator for 1064. So the lasers will have a 1064 and 532 generated differently with the advancement of technology. But initially, two lasers not possible. One laser only, and you just pass through a filter and becomes another laser. So that was a very great thing that time. Because one laser used to be costing in crores of rupees, and one laser laser used to be a very huge machine. And you have two lasers, two different wavelengths, red and green, you know, same. Just just passing a filter in between. That time it was much magic. So it was called a quality switching. You change the quality of laser. So means you got a very a different laser because ten sixty four a red laser is different and a green laser is different. That's a Q switching. But now they people use the same wording for a nanosecond lasers. Means you are getting a very narrow pulse width laser. Also they call Q switching. But that is not very technical. Your physics wise correct. All right, sir. Um, rest of the questions have been beautifully covered by your lecture itself, sir. Uh, thank you so much for spending your valuable time with us and uh, spreading knowledge uh, to all the ocular plasty uh, and all the postgraduates and ophthalmology who shall be viewing this lecture later as well. Uh, before we conclude for today, I have a small announcement. uh the next we meet will be on 4th of october and the topic being eyelid and periocular trauma evaluation and management by dr aditi pujari thank you so very much sir thank okay. you sir bye sir thank thanks shefal